Welcome to the Software Engineering Mentorship Session by Blessing Malumi. Blessing is a software engineer at Microsoft Lagos. You're welcome, Blessing. I also helped um, build like some of the performance management system that we are like HR tools. And then with Microsoft, where I work, I am part of the global team that keeps customers product productive and protected. So if you look at the um, if you look at the Windows updates that you get on your system. So my team is responsible, a little bit responsible for that. We are building a service that allows you to test your application before you get the Windows updates. So before Windows updates gets to your system and then you're allowed to install it on your system, we allow customers and software vendors who build software applications to test the application on those updates. So that if there's any issue, maybe with their systems not being compatible with the updates, or maybe from our end, we fix it before the update gets to the world. And we are selling over 1 billion devices all over the world. So that's very inspiring for me. And I find a lot of meaning and joy doing what I do every day because I know that I'm solving a lot of problems by keeping customers productive and keeping them protected. So aside from work, I'm very passionate about education. I teach young children how to code. I'm passionate about women. I also teach young ladies how to code. And then I'm passionate about artificial intelligence, a little bit of fashion, technology, finance, agriculture. So I, I work with a lot of people to build products in this, in this space. Like, you know, if you have an interesting idea, maybe in the agricultural space, in the finance space, we could work together and then we can see what we we'll do, essentially. Now moving on, this is my favorite quote. Says thou a man diligent in his business, it will stand before kings, it will not stand before men. And so the reason why this is my favorite quote is because you know, like over over the period of time I've worked, when I wake up in the morning, I'm always like, um, how do I make myself relevant in my space? How do I become useful and productive and valuable? And one thing that stood out for me is being diligent. So it inspires me every day to work on being diligent at what I do, because I know that at the end of the day, I would have the opportunity to stand before kings and present my ideas, you know, and also solve bigger problems. So this is for you. You can think about this in your spare time. You know, this is what happens when you're diligent. You stand before kings and you do not stand before men. So this always motivates me to work one of the things that motivates me to work every day. Now, um, okay, moving on to the next slide. So I'm going to be going, walking you through my career journey on getting started with software engineering, you know, and I'll be sharing how you can start at a newbie, how I got started. And um, maybe, so this, is, this information will be relevant to you if you are a student, if you are looking to transition from maybe what you're doing currently to software engineering. And maybe if, if you are a graduate, you know, graduate from computer science or engineering and you want to start um, software engineering. And then I would also be sharing opportunities that you can maximize, you know, opportunities that are available and how to maximize opportunities and embrace challenges, which is basically how my career journey has been so far. And then I'll be sharing how you can excel and succeed in your role as a software engineer. Now, getting started and following your interest. So in software engineering, there are different career paths. So I've outlined just four major career paths in software engineering. I would, I would want to make this um, session as interactive as possible. So we have the front end development, the mobile development, the back end development and data science. Then I think there are other things like embedded system as well, but these are the four major um, career paths we have, we have in software engineering. So for front end, front end developers are the people who build the applications and the websites that you can see and interact with. So just like your Zoom, this is a Zoom chat app, those um, icons that you can see, how you can click the buttons, the front end engineers are responsible for building that part of the application. Then for the mobile, mobile developers are people who build softwares for the OSs that your mobile devices, that run on your mobile devices. And there are three major 
OSs. We have the Android, we have the iOS, and then we have the Windows. And then the, the some of the skills that they actually require. Can you guys hear me? Some of the skills that they require is Objective C. They require, obje yeah, they require Objective C and um, Android, and then that's for for building um, mobile mobile applications. And then for front end, you want to know more about HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and some frameworks like um, React and the likes and Angular. Then for back end, back end, which is where I sit, are the people who build the servers that provide the data and connectivity to the front end application. So let's take for instance, I go to an application and I want to enter my name and maybe just the form, right? So now, when you enter that information, a server receives that request and stores that information in the database, right? And then at a point in time, you might want to see the information that you've entered into the application. The same server would retrieve the application from the database and present it to the front end. So the front end web, presents the data it receives from the server and makes it very beautiful for you to see on the front end. So I work on the side of things where um, I'm we are working with servers and building um, connectivity between the front end and the server so that there is no latency. When I, what I mean by latency is that as the front end is trying to retrieve data from the server, it's as fast as possible, right? So those are some of the things that I deal with. I deal with database, making sure that the connectivity is good, you know, is not slow, because you want to visit a site that is very responsive and it's quick to give you your request as much as possible. And then for data science, these are people who write codes to find meaning in data. So some of the skill sets you would need for this kind of path is Python and R. For backend, you would need things like C Sharp, Python, Java, JavaScript. So I don't know if anyone could hear me, what other, um, what other tools do you think we would need, you know, for this um, career path? I'm very sure that there are very there are, there are a lot of, you know, amazing guys here. Like, you know, so who can tell me other skills that is required for this career path? Let's say backend development. You can just put that on the chat room. You know, we could all share our knowledge and experience together. So for backend, what other skills or what other programming tools would you need if you want to be a backend developer just put it on the chat php very good unduli obina very good who else but the data are very good sql thank you antony thank you guys so now let's move on to the next thing now getting started and transitioning react react is for front end sql Basically, okay. SQL is for you can use SQL for for backend as well. For Windows, you would need Xamarin for building Windows mobile application. Yeah. So now getting started and transitioning from a role that is not either in the computer science or engineering field to maybe let's say you're a business person or a and customer support, or you're just in a different field entirely, how do I transition into software engineering? So one of the things I would outline, because I came from a systems engineering background, I didn't do computer science, but some of the things that helped me to actually transition to a role in software engineering are the things I'm going to highlight here, and I would share that based on a personal experience. So. I would, one of the things that inspired me, so one of the things that I liked the idea is identifying a goal. Because so one of the things that really inspired me was my goal to be an AI engineer. And that came about as a result of a class I attended back then in school. So, in, so one day in my final year, one of this lecturer just walked into my classroom. And then for, that was my first semester. And then he told us that we'll be learning about artificial intelligence. And then he started sharing a lot of things about what artificial intelligence was about, that is the way of widening the range of things the computer can do. And you know, basic things that the computers can do is like your, your, your basic processing, like mathematical operation, that's what you see with your word and example. But now he was saying that I can use, with my knowledge on field of, with the field of artificial intelligence, computers can be able to make decisions like humans, 
you know, and observe and be able to identify objects, computer, which is like computer vision. You know, when he was painting that picture to me, I discovered and realized that, oh, that is a field I want to play in or be in. So that interest was right back then at the back of my mind. And I, pay, I paid so much attention in class and I was like, yes, I want to do artificial intelligence, you know, just because my lecturer back then was, he just explained, just told me about it and it sounded very interesting. Then I didn't even know anything about programming. I'd not done anything relating to programming at all. So after school, I reached out to him, that's the same lecturer and we started a conversation. I shared my career interest with him and my career prospect that this is what I'm looking out for. And he decided to guide me through and that was where he introduced me to my first programming language, which was Python. So that day after school, when I was waiting for NYC, I sent him an email and then he was, he replied and he was like, oh, he's going to help me through this process. And I was so excited and he was like, okay, I'm going to first of all learn how to program in Python. And I was like, wow, that day I jumped, I was very happy at home telling all my sisters that, wow, I found a mentor, someone that would teach me how to program and be an AI engineer, right? So. I started, I started with Python and I took a course. It shared a link with me on YouTube. That course was about one hour and that was where I learned how to, learned how to um, write Python programming. And then from then on, I started going through other resources like um, Codecademy to further broaden my understanding of to further broaden my understanding of of Python programming, so for Code Academy, I took a the I took the Python track. I started it from beginning to the end, and I did that during my NYC. So roughly, I spent about two years learning how to program and understanding the basics of programming. Then, in the course of learning as well, I also joined a community, which is very important. I joined the community. As one of the communities I joined was, um, can everyone hear me? Okay, so I just saw the communities I joined were Google Developers Group, Microsoft Student Partners, Django Girls, you know, so when I was serving, I, I, I was part of Django Girls and I helped mentor young girls to build web applications, you know, and then the importance of this community is, is that it gives you access to opportunities and resources, you know, that would help you in your career journey. And why this stands out for me was because my first job was actually gotten from this community. My first job in my, with um, Venture Garden Group. So it was as a result of this community that I got access to the information on how to, I got access to the opportunity for the role of a female Python developer, right? And then that was how I started my professional journey in, in, um, software engineering. I would also, in the course of this presentation, I'll be sharing with you what kind of mindset I had when I got an opportunity after learning for a period of two years, learning by myself, being a self-taught programmer, how I was able to ace my interview, right? So now we'll go on to some of the resources that will be very helpful. I know many of you will be wondering, how can I learn? What's the best way to learn how to program? You know, you're yeah, thinking about, should I teach myself? Should I join? Should I go to a school to learn? You know, for me, I, I taught myself programming, right? And I also wanted to somehow try the structured program as well. So everybody's part is different. So I think one thing you want to first of all discover for yourself is um, how, what suits you and just starting now. And then starting with the minimum resources that you would require to learn how to program, right? So for the minimum resources that you, require, you would require to learn, you just need a computer system and the internet. And some of, some of these resources I'll be sharing with, some of them do not even require you to pay any money, right? So you would have, there, 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 um, there, are some, there are some resources like Full Stack Python. Full Stack Python guides you to, so this one, so for me, also depending on the type of learner that you have, that you are. For me, I'm, a, I'm not a video learner. I prefer to read and practice when I'm learning. So even when I'm learning a programming language, I would first of all start with video, but the video must not be too long. If it's too long, I will get bored. 
But for me, I, I prefer to read the text. If I read the text, I understand it a lot better than when I watch a video. So I, that was one of the reasons why I went with Code Academy because Code Academy, they just explained what the code was about and they gave me instructions on how to write my own code and I just followed through with that because that was my own type of learning. So for, so I've, I've created these resources in such a way that you'll be able to see which one works for you. So I put Code Academy there. Full Stack Python helps you to learn how to be a developer, a, a Python developer. So you learn basic skills in Python, you would learn, web development like Django and the Flax framework. And if you're looking at data science, it has a little bit of data science in it as well. Then Fit Code Camp is for web development, like the front end that I talked about. So here you'll be learning about um, different frameworks like React, you'll be learning about HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and you'll build a lot of projects that you can work on. And then there's the Andela Learning Community. Some of them are giving scholarships to people for different tracks and parts. And then with those, with those communities, you can also learn how to program as well. Then for offline, offline programs, these are programs where some of them are actually online. Some of them are requires you to actually visit the organizations to attend classes and lectures every day. We have things like the HN, HNG internship. They have curriculum that guides you on how to actually be a developer. We have Decagon, we have Stoturn, and some of these um, offline programs actually gives you the opportunity to first of all learn, and after you finish learning, you can now um, make money. So when you get a job, you can now start paying them. And one, one of these resources I, really, I, really, I would really recommend is Microverse. So at some point when I was learning, I, was, I, try, I checked out Microverse. Microverse is for remote developers, it's global. And it gives you this, what I'm highlighting at the moment, it gives you opportunity to actually learn how to work with remote teams. Because now looking at the COVID situation, many of the jobs online are software engineering jobs, right? Many of the jobs are software engineering jobs. And, you know, they give you, it gives you opportunities to learn how to work with remote teams. And of course, if, most, if money is your motivation, the people that will pay you the most are people abroad, right? So if you work with this microverse, you would actually learn how to work with remote teams abroad. And you, only, you would only be paid, you would only have to pay them once you get your first job. They have a very a standard curriculum that you can follow, you know, and stuff like that. I can see some questions in the chat room from Noble Kenneth. I would, I would be, some of the things I'll be talking about, we touch, we touch on the questions that has been asked already you know, and I'll be going through with that. So now, the simplest way to take action, which is for every one of you on, on, this, on this call, is first of all, leveraging on your, in, on your interest to build a project that would help you build your new skill. So after you've learned, it's not enough for you to keep learning every day. You need to build something. And that's it's what you build that would help you to project yourself to any employer that you can do what is claimed that you can do, right? And then I see someone asking questions on um, what programming language. So for me, I started with Python and I always recommend Python for people, you know, because it's, it's very simple and it's very easy. The same line of code that you use in writing um, a, maybe a, a simple logic, as compared to C sharp, is very short. So let's say you want to write um, add two plus two. In Python, you just do that, add two plus two, but in C sharp, you still have to call a class, you have to call so many things and then do that. So I would say that you would, the best way to do that is to actually start with Python. Python is very easy and simple. And then are there any communities for people that are not students? Yes. For me, I started. I joined. I joined a um, Google Developers Group after school, right? And it was on those communities in that community group that was where I learned. I found the opportunity. And the easiest way to be able to join those communities is by attending meetups. So if you attend, so there's a site called Meetup that you can go to that will give you access to different um, programming groups that you can join. So when you go for any of the meetups, you would meet people who are already part of those communities that you can join. For me, I was, I was already in one, and I just found a link, and I was like, okay, let me just join, and I was already part of the WhatsApp group, so every day I see information about different opportunities, I see information about 
um, things that are happening in the tech space, you know, maybe a conference that is coming up, things that I can learn, you know, and stuff like that. So communities are very important. I see job opportunities as well on the group, you know. So now going back to my slides, leveraging on, on your interest. For me, because I was interested in, in fashion, I decided that I was going to build something relating, relating to fashion, use my knowledge of Python to build something relating to fashion. So I built a very simple fashion app with Django then, you know, and that was also what I used when I was training the girls on how to, on web development processes in Python. And then, like I said, I also used tutorials that helped me to build the fashion app. And I had some of my code on GitHub, you know, just a very few, which I, I'm sure many people would go there to go and take a look at it. It's not very comprehensive like that. And then when I was applying for the role and the opportunity I, I found on the, on the group, on, on the community that I belong to, that was one of the skills, one of the things that I highlighted on my cover letter. You know, I didn't have a computer science background. I didn't even have a work experience as a software engineer. But when I was sending out my CV, I had a cover letter that highlighted all the projects I had worked on. I had, I had, I had, I highlighted all the projects I worked on. I worked on the fashion app and I told them that, well, I've done this before, you know, and that gave me an opportunity to be invited for an interview. So um, this is one of the simplest ways to get started. So if you're looking at how to get started, first of all, find a project you can, that is based on your interest. Your, your interest might be cooking, maybe how to build a, a cooking app. Very simple, it doesn't have to be too complex. It can be how to make a recipe like make, a, make rice, how to boil rice, or how to make jollof rice. And then your app would, would highlight the steps to make jollof rice, you know? It doesn't have, it can even be a calculator. As long as you are building something that you can show to any employer that's looking for someone with your skill set, or demonstrate that you have a knowledge and expertise with this particular language, that would put you, put you at an advantage. Now, I was talking about, um, leveraging on opportunities, maximizing opportunities and, and challenges. And I'll be sharing the key, some very key points or some, some key things that really helped me, you know, first of all, in landing the job, my first, my first programming job, after I'd learned for a couple of two years, you know, by myself, being self-taught. Some people, if you go through the structured program, you might spend less than one year because they have the curriculum on the things that you need to do and the projects that you would work on at the end of the, at, at the, end of the program. But for me, because I was self-taught, I was juggling it with my, my other jobs, which are not relating to software engineering at all. So even if you are not actually working as a software engineer, even if you're a business person, you can still start learning how to program by yourself using the resources I've shared before. You know, just dedicate time to focus on it and follow through with it. And to motivate yourself is why I shared that you need to have a project that you're working on. So now, one of the things that really helped me when I was, after I'd gotten the chance to come and prove myself that, oh yes, I know how to program, right? And I've built this project because I, I waited for like three months and I got called by Venture Garden Group, you know? So my first interview, on my CV, there was no, there was no, there was no, there was no experience of working experience of software engineering, you know? And of course I was, I was working in an organization where my, my career objective wasn't fulfilled. I still had my goal in mind, which was to be an AI engineer. But I also identified that for me to be an AI engineer, I needed the tools that would help me to build AI application, which is, which, which, which of these, which one of them is software engineering, right? So I, I took the first step. And that's what I'm employing you all to do. Take the first step. So your first step can be to start programming. Just go to a site, buy a computer, buy a computer, install the IDEs on it and start programming, you know. And then another thing was that I didn't wait until I was perfect before I applied for the job. Many people, they've been learning for many years, but they've not applied for any role. I had learned for two years, when well, immediately I saw the opportunity, I applied. I didn't say, oh, I must have known this thing. I must have built massive projects before I can apply for it. I didn't even have a work experience in software engineering, but I was actually doing something else. I was working as a network engineer, you know, and the likes. So I didn't wait until I was perfect before I applied. And then another thing was I had understood 
the basis of programming. And that's what many, and the basis of problem solving. That was what, that's what many interviews are looking, interview, interviewers are looking for when they invite you for an interview. They're not looking for how well you know the language. You don't want to see that you can solve a problem with the language. So it's very good for you to understand the language and understand how to solve problems. And I think that is something that stood out for me, that, made, that gave me an advantage when I came for my first interview. You know, so at the time I arrived at the interview, I was told to write, solve a problem with Python. I think this was reverse a string in Python and I should write the logic on the board, right? I didn't have my IDE to work with, you know, but because I understood how it works, I understood strings, I understood all the basics of programming, I was able to write it down step by step, break it down into smaller problems and actually solve, do, um, um, actually write the code, you know, and at the end of my code, I was not asked to explain what I, why, I, why I wrote it that way and explain my thought process. I didn't cram. If I had crammed, I would have been faltering at that point. But because I understood how to solve the problem, I broke it down like, first of all, you would use this method to either split it, you know, and then you can use this method to reverse it and then save it in this variable. You know, by explaining that, I'm sure the interviewer was like, oh, she knows what she's talking about. She knows how to solve the problem. You know, and then another thing that actually helped me is keeping an open mind. So I wasn't feeling I was too smart. You know, many times you don't want to ask questions because you don't want people to, we don't, we don't want people to um, think that we're dumb, you know. So another thing that helped me was always keeping an open mind. Right. Now, so I'll be talking, here yeah, I'm going to be talking about applying for the rule. Right, after you've learned for a couple of years or a couple of months, what are the things that you need to take note of when applying for a software engineering role? First of all, I'm looking at, I'm looking at students who are seeking internships and graduates with either a, a computer science or engineering background or those with non-engineering background. So for students, you know, one of the things I look out for, because recently we had this opening for internships in Microsoft, you know, and because the opening was out to the public, a lot of guys applied for the role and we didn't have many strong female female um female software engineers or female applicants so i put it out there on my status that i needed female engineers or female people that were intern looking for internship female co females with computer science background i put it out there on my status and i got a lot of um cvs as a result of that and for me when I was taking a look at the series, some of the things that I took, that stood out for me, that helped me to decide on if I was taking this person's CV to the next stage or not, were some of these things that I, I have highlighted before. I like that, yeah. So focusing on your studies and having a strong GP is very important. Good GP, you know. So I was looking out for the educational qualification of the students and their involvement in the community and simple project. I put simple. Because you don't have to build a very massive system, simple projects that they've worked on, either while in the classroom or while with their involvement in the community. So I got several CVs. Some CVs, some people's CVs just highlighted that, oh, I just have a degree. I'm, I'm, I have a degree in computer science, I'm looking for a role. You know, with that kind of CV, I wasn't even inspired to send it to the IRE manager. But there were some CVs that I saw that showed that, oh, I've been part of the Google Developers Group. I led a team that did this. While I was in class, we built this simple project. In fact, even when I was even having conversation with some of the girls I was chatting with, I was asking them questions. I said, okay, so why are you in school? Did you, did you build anything while you're in class? Why don't you put it on your CV, you know? So I was asking about that and all that. So that really, um, those are some of the things that would, would make you stand out if you are seeking for internship opportunities in friends like Microsoft, Facebook, and Google. Make sure you're part of the community and build simple projects that you can highlight on your CV. And then for graduates, you need to also build your personal brand. For me, one of the things that helped me, apart from my engineering, like software engineering experience in virtual garden group, was I had a good LinkedIn profile that I let tell the things I've worked on and the projects I've built. You know, and you see hiring recruiters or recruiters reaching out to you on LinkedIn based off on your profile and based off on the things that you put on your profile, you know? And another thing is your knowledge of tools. 
tools that you use in a software engineering field like CICD, which is continuous integration and continuous um, de um, deployment, version control, you know, and some of these things would actually help you when you are looking for a job in as a graduate. Then preparing for the interview. One of the major things you want to do is to learn about the organization and the interviewers, right? So for me, when I was preparing for my Microsoft interviews, of course, I was sent to people that were going to interview me. I learned about them. I went to check them out on LinkedIn, you know, learned about their interests. And that was what helped me to start up a conversation with them. And I was, I was talking to them. I was, had, I was able to start, start up a conversation with them. Another thing that also helped me was preparing for the coding interview. So I, I practiced a lot. I practiced a lot of algorithms. On, and I use interview cake, I use hacker rank, I use cracking the coding interview. You know, I really, really practiced when I was preparing for the interview. And then I also was myself. And then when I was asked to talk about myself, I talked about the project I had worked on. I wouldn't say this was part of what made gave me an edge, but you know, I was myself and I I just I wasn't fidgeting. They made me to feel as relaxed as possible. And that's what many interviewers actually do you know, when you come for your interview. And then I was asked to solve problems and I was able to explain my problem. Many times they're looking for how you can collaborate when you're in the interview because you're not the only one solving the problem. They want to see if you can communicate your ideas and also collaborate with other people while you're working on the problems. So I think that was what helped me. Now, to succeed and excel in your role as, your, as a software engineer, I know we have a lot of chats, a lot of um, questions on the chat room, um, and time is almost fast spent. I want to just quickly touch on some of the skills that you need to succeed in your role as a software engineer. You need technical skills and soft skills. So for technical skills, some of the things that you need to know is, um, first of all, like I mentioned before, the basics of programming, data structures and algorithms, system design and architecture, clean code and unit testing. So for me, all these skills I learned while, on, while I was on the job, you know, and you would get them when you're working with people. And when you're working with a team or you're working in a technology firm, you know. And then another, some, some, another soft skill, some, some of the soft skills I also had to develop was growth, a growth mindset. Debunking the fact that I, I should know everything, you know, and some of the things that actually also motivated me was the quest to learn. Every day I always wanted to learn. And many times, some of the decisions I made was because I wanted to just learn. You know, moving from organizations to organizations, applying for roles was just because I wanted to learn. And that has kept me going many of the time. And I'm, I'm always very curious, you know, about new things and those things inspire me. So now I want to go on to questions because we have just a couple of minutes left. I've been talking a lot. <laughs> so I see here that, um, what advice would you have for someone who doesn't really like to code, but loves the tech space a lot? I'm trying to learn Python, but I want to join as a PM. How possible is this? Yes. So like, I would say that for, for companies like Microsoft, one of our, one of our major um, programming tool is C Sharp, although we still have people who write um, JavaScript and Python as well, you know, but if you want to, Java 2 is also one of our programming language. So if you really want to stand out quickly, you know, it would be good for you to learn C Sharp and Java, you know, after you've probably learned Python. Python is easier to learn as compared to C Sharp and Java. And Mosh, like someone pointed out here, is actually very good. When I started learning C Sharp, I used Mosh videos to learn how to write C Sharp. You know, that really helped me when I was on my, on my job. Okay, so I think my, you, um, Stephanie, you could read out some of the questions, some of the ones that I've missed. Okay, all right, Ma. So, Noko Kenneth asked, saying, please, which of the programming language would you advise I start with as an upcoming backend developer? Okay, so, one of the, one of the, like, I, I think I, I answered this question, but 
I would advise you start with Python. Python is very easy to learn as a backend developer. And with Python, you can even switch to data science if you want. Then you, when you are learning Python, you need to understand like different frameworks like Django and Flax for backend development because those are the frameworks you use in building your servers. Yeah. Okay, okay. So someone else saying, I want to create AI applications. Should I focus on data science or software development? So if you want to create AI applications, for me, right, when I started, I, I, everybody's path is different. So you can, you can also start with data science. You can also start with software engineering. Me, I had a mixture of both. So I also do a little bit of data science. And at the same time, I'm working as a software engineer. The reason why I went with software engineering was because I wanted to first of all understand how to build systems, how to architect and how to build systems. And you might not really get that knowledge from AI, starting with AI applications. But maybe when you start building, you can now also learn, right? But for me, I just wanted to know how to build. How, how does this thing work? What are the things that, put, uh, that come together to build, to make the system function the way it functions? That was the reason why I actually went for software engineering and I decided to apply for roles in that space. So depending on your interest, you can, you can do a mixture of both, you know, and depending on what, why you want to do it. Some people started as data science and they are building AI applications at the same time. But many of the people that I've spoken to, they all have software engineering background. Like all my friends, even in Microsoft, we have an AI team. And the two of, two of my friends on the team, actually, they actually write software. They're actually software engineers, but they build AI applications. So you can't overestimate understanding how to build systems before building AI applications. So it's different from being a data scientist. Do you understand? So I guess that's the difference. Any other question? Okay, thank you very much. Um, someone else is asking, if I want to learn Python, which best resource will, your, will be your advice for learning? For learning. So to learn Python, I would, I would advise you start with Codecademy. Codecademy is a very good resource. That's if you are someone that likes text. But if you're looking at maybe videos and other tutorials, then you can, you can go on to Udacity and Udemy. They have a lot of um, courses there that would help you to learn how to program in Python. And then for structured learning, I, I put um, Lambda. Okay, Lambda School does not really do Python. I don't think they do Python. I think, okay, yeah, those ones do not really do Python. They also do web. So I would just advise Codecademy. You can also do full stack, full stack Python. If you are looking at text, me, I'm a text person, so I know those resources and I use those resources and it worked for me. But if you are looking at video, you can look at resources on Udemy, Udacity, and EDX. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Ma. Um, so another person is asking, okay, it's the same question, it's the same question. Another question from some Someone transitioning from another career, how can we get mentors? Hmm. This is a very good question. So, like, I know that on LinkedIn, there are lots of people who share links on matching people with mentors, right? On any field, right? So, one way to actually get mentors first is to join a community, like I said. If you join a community, you'd meet people who are professionals or who are very good in that space and you can just reach out to them and tell them oh i'm learning how to program can you guide me or what the, what are the things i can do, i can do and then you can share your codes with them send them connect to them on send them pull request on on github let them help you to review your code you know so for me if you if you want me to you could you could send me your your code i could help you review your code and give you feedback on how your code is doing you know, some people don't provide that structured part, but you can just reach out to anybody and just talk to them that, oh, I'm, I'm actually learning this. Can you put me through? What are the things I can learn? Ask them questions, you know, and then they'll be able to, to like guide you on what you need to do. I think some people ask me some private questions. Okay, thank you very much. So another one is, do you see a future in web design? 
do I see a future in web design? Yes, I see a future in web design because they are very creative, you know, and computers cannot replace that creativity. And everybody is uniquely creative. Web design involves a lot of creativity and efforts put into designing how the look and feel of a web page. So for, for me, if you want to venture into web design, I would say you focus and focus more on your creativity skills. You know, be inspired. Join forums where you can be inspired by other people's designs. You know, find things that inspire you. Maybe it could be nature, you know, and create beautiful things out of it. So I would say that there's still a future for web design. You know, and even and another thing in web design, you can be looking at user-centered design. Many times you want to improve your customer's experience when they are working with your web applications, right? So you can start thinking about it in that line. As a user, when I come to a website, what, what would make me stay on this website? What would make me enjoy using this website? That's another way to think about web design. And all this stems from web design. If, this is, if the website is not designed properly, as a user, I would not want to visit the website. So there is always a use case and a future for it. And computers have not been able to, or AI has not been able to replace that because human beings are naturally gifted with creativity, not computers. So there is a future for web design. Well, okay. mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much, Ma. Thank you. Very, very good. So I'm going to leave you guys with my best resource. Okay. Free for developers, it's called Free for Dev. So if you visit this Free for Dev, you will see a lot of resources that would help you with software testing, code quality, you know, and all these things are free. They just provide you platforms that you can use to. Why I why are working as a software engineer? You know, sometimes maybe you are building on the cloud. Maybe you build an application. How do I host it? I have to pay money for web servers. I have to pay money for database. How do I make people use my application that is already on the on the cloud? So some of these some these resources in this particular website gives you some free tier offerings of platforms that you can use to further make your applications available to users on the web. You know, so after you build the application, you want to monitor it to make sure that it's working efficiently. I didn't really talk about that. And so there are tools that you can use to monitor it. You know, you also want to make sure that the quality of your application is good. There are no error messages. That's for the side of a backend engineer. So I'm looking at performance. I'm looking at quality. I'm looking at errors. I'm looking at logins. You know, so there are tools that help me to do that. And I'm always, you would always want to be checking out those tools so that in case there's any need for you to scale your server, to be able to serve more people, serve more users that are visiting your application all the time, you know, it to be easier for you. So knowledge of those tools are very important for you as a software engineer, actually as a backend engineer. Performance and knowing how to scale your resources to serve more people or serve more people that are using your APIs or your servers, basically. So someone is asking, do you need to know how to code to be a project manager or a product manager? Well, I think it's essential for you to understand how people write code, but it's not compulsory. And then finally, I think this brings me to the end of my session. Thank you very much. You can connect with me on LinkedIn at Blessing Malumi. You can send me an email or you can connect with me on Instagram. You know, if you send me a message on LinkedIn, I would respond. Or if you connect with me, I would accept your request. And then if you have any question, you can also reach out to me on LinkedIn as well. You can also send me an email. I'm open to any form of connection and request. Thank you very much. Yeah. The line is breaking. I can't really hear what you're saying. Let's awesome session. Is it clear now? Yes, it's clear now. awesome session. I'm very sure we all learned.
Yeah. So, uh, for everyone on this group, the Java Man Career Fair is coming up right after this session. So, we have been dropping the link to ensure you join back. Okay. So, thank you. <laughs> I really get a lot of feedback. Okay. Um, so like the question, do you mind collating them? I don't know how to respond to them. I know I wasn't able to respond to a lot of questions. Yes, yes. Okay. So uh I'll collate the questions and send them through mail. Okay. Is that fine? That's fine. So then right. if you're on the call, you yeah, asking if that you you yeah you love tech and you love app testing, which is what you do. How do you start up a career in tech? Because what you're seeing here is so different to you. So I remember I mentioned talking about transitioning. So the first thing that you want to know is first of all have a computer and um, internet that you can use to learn. Sometimes you might not if you don't have internet resources, you can actually find if you join a community too as well, you'll find someone that has a a lot of data or a lot of resources that, are, that have been saved in a file that you can just copy and start learning with as well so just start start with python and i'm sure even in your app testing you would need to use you might need to learn how to write some scripts so python is one of the easiest ways to actually even get started and then for pressures do i need to know how to code to be a project manager or a product manager you don't necessarily need to learn how to code but it's good to understand how it works you know just have a, have a basic understanding so even when you are talking to developers and they are saying a lot of things you know how to communicate with them and understand their language as a product manager or a project manager just have an understanding it's not compulsory you know so um i don't know if there are still any other person on the call I'm trying to answer the questions as much as possible okay okay thank you very much ma thank you ma our time is fast i'm really really sorry so i will send it thank you very much for that awesome session thank you Thank you guys. Yes. Uh -huh. So please, yes, please join the group that is on the chat. The gentleman. Okay. Okay.